All right, good morning, value listeners. This is Craig Ashton. The show is all things legal, personal injury, attorneys, distilling, topical events into legal essence. What does that mean? Guess what? We're attorneys by trade, curious by nature. Tend to goals make you the most interesting conversationalist at your next dinner party or barbecue. Do not conflate uh, the lack of uh, gravitas and levity for what we do for a living. What we do for a living is serious business. Yeah, just this week, uh, yeah, basically solidifying the legal issues associated with a man on a motorcycle who had a corporate vehicle make a left-hand turn in front of him. He has a fractured left tibia, fibula, a femur, uh, fractured pelvis. He's probably got torn ACL. They, they haven't uh, focused on the knee yet because they're focused on the most obvious injuries. Uh, and uh, have a case expedited trial going uh, to trial in San Francisco next three months with a 82-year-old that's hit by a tourist I'm on Market Street in Goff who spent 17 days in ICU. Those are cases that require serious focus, laser-like, uh, basically attention to detail. These stories are not those stories, and I'll break them down in a second after I introduce Edward Allen Shady. Hey, good morning, valued listeners. Hey, we've got a new listener out there. Good morning, Jamie. I'm glad you're tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> this is when you get a shady attorney, give you some legal direction, the very, probably the only time I can say it. I, th- I think uh, sometimes uh, we engage in hyperbole just to make the show a little bit more entertaining. Uh, we never go into the realm of m- untruths, but hyperbole perhaps, uh, just to get you to think. And I don't think it's uh, a hyperbolic statement to say that this is the one and only time you want a shady attorney to give some legal direction. Let me break down the stories for you. True. True. Let me break down the stories for you to determine whether or not you want to spend the next hour of your existence engaged in this experience. Elon Musk. He's from uh, Musk till dawn. Um, this guy's just a character. He's in the middle of a $44 billion lawsuit with Twitter. He's a twit. Yeah. <laughs> He's out on a pr- uh, private yacht. And not that big. I mean, uh, basically, Jeff Bezos' yacht, yacht is so big that Jeff Bezos' yacht can't even get under a bridge out of Amsterdam, right, where they build <laughs> ships. I mean, his ship is so big that it is bigger than the other ships they've always built because he's, you know, right up there with the richest man in the world. Plus, Jeff Bezos is getting all ripped up. And you got pictures of Elon Musk during what's happening, what we're going to talk about in the chancery in Delaware, where there's going to be a trial coming up in the next th- three or four months for whether or not there's going to be a forced enforcement of the contract to buy Twitter for $44 billion. So Elon Musk uh, basically took the time to hang out without a shirt on. Uh, boy, he is um, he's alabaster. Oh, yeah. And, and, and they were making fun of him because uh, when he was standing there because he was so white uh, in terms of the t- uh, color and tone of his skin that they put a French bulldog on its hind legs, kind of looking up onto a chair, and it, they said, this looks like Elon Musk. And while the hearing was going on, he tweeted back, um, I think I have better calves. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how seriously this guy's taking this. So we're going to talk about uh, basically what can happen here. Um, he's got basically, he can settle this case. He can pay that uh, billion-dollar uh, basically liquidated damages clause. Um, he, he can lose and be, be ordered to buy Twitter, or he can win and basically walk away. Or he can buy the company for negotiate a settlement uh, for less than a fifty four twenty. Again, kind of sophomoric where he put four twenty in there, which is a colloquialism to refer to the use of marijuana. He did the same thing when he said he was taking Twitter. I mean, uh, uh, Tesla private at four hundred twenty dollars. He said he'd already gotten financing. Again, four twenty a reference to the use of marijuana, and he got in trouble with the SEC for that. I mean, this guy believes that these are you know basically it's all fun and games. And this is what the lawsuit said against him. And I think this is great language. It says, look, Elon Musk having mounted a public spectacle to put Twitter in play, because Twitter didn't ask for this, and having proposed and then signed a seller-friendly merger agreement, and he proposed it, Musk apparently believes that he, unlike every other party subject to Delaware contract law, is free to change his mind, then trash the company, disrupt its operations, destroy sh- stockholder value, and walk away. He said, no. And guess what? We're going to break down some companies that had this very issue in Delaware. Uh, one of them was basically um, Tiffany and uh, LVMH, which is Hennessy, Moe, and Louis Vuitton. Uh, basically had this very same issues. And then other companies would have similar issues with COVID, had similar issues with not being able to get financing. Delaware said, no, guess what? Um, you have to show not only good faith, you have to show best efforts. I mean, it's a high standard. You have to show best efforts. So I think Elon Musk is in trouble. We'll break that down. Talk about trouble. UCLA and USC are leaving the Pac-12 to go to the Big Ten. And that is harming Cal. And I talked about it last week on the show. uh, And I basically said, look, how does this happen? That the reliance in terms of the conference is basically not solidified in any sort of contractual agreement. 
and that when the TV contracts are up, essentially it becomes a free-for-all. I, I, I cannot believe that you have this much money at stake and none of the other schools are protected. And the two largest, the two schools in the biggest, second biggest market in the country in Los Angeles can just leave. And then what, what got me is that Cal birthed UCLA. UCLA is a public school, a public UC school. But it's saying we're out. And apparently they have a right to do that. But Gavin Newsom is now asking UCLA to explain publicly. All right. Tell us how it's not only just benefiting the student athletes who play on the football team, but all of your student athletes. Because you owe a duty to all of them. Because now you're going to have to be flying back east, all over the place for water polo, for basically, you know, uh, track and field, et cetera. How does that benefit the students when they're traveling, you know, 14 hours around trip you know, to, to compete? And then also you've got to explain how you can do this when you're harming Cal. Because that's another public school who's part of the Pac-12. So you need to do that. So we'll talk about the legal issues there. Arnold Schwarzenegger. This woman has total recall. Uh, Schwarzenegger said his true lies. And he's acting like Conan the Barbarian, a kindergarten cop. He had an escape plan. And the aftermath was not a last action hero. Arnold Schwarzenegger, according to this 81-year-old uh, Miriam Margolis, who was in Harry Potter, says Arnold Schwar Schwarzenegger during End of Days, which is she played Satan's mother, mm. held him down and deliberately farted in her face. There you have it. He said, not I'll be back. Yeah. You'll hear my backside. The Expendables <laughs> Part 2. <laughs> so we'll talk about assault, battery, work comp, whether or not there's a defamation cause of action. Because, you know, that is basically a statement of fact saying that Arnold Schwarzenegger hold, held down somebody who's basically seven years older than him. And then, a, you know, a, a woman during a professional undertaking, which is acting, and deliberately passed gas uh, right in under her proboscis. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, somebody's gonna say that film stinks. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. Florida man, Florida man. We got four Florida man stories for you. Trying to main to maintain a steady flow of traffic. Florida man accused of urinating in the middle of a street while he's directing it. <laughs> uh, yeah, he had a good reason though. I'll give him that. <laughs> yeah, right. And then how about? Pear, this is a whole new definition of false imprisonment. Pear spent two days locked up in the Daytona, D Daytona State College uh, college in a closet for two days. They said they couldn't get out. Turns out the door was unlocked. Yeah, well, that's why they're not at Cal or UCLA. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that is false imprisonment because they never were imprisoned, but we'll talk about the legal issues associated there. Time traveling. Florida man crashes car in a building. Uncle Rico goes back to the future. Basically, there's several things that you can basically know that are facts in life. So this guy crashed his car into advanced tax services right next to Pensacola Caskets. So yep. what we've got are three things that are definitely always going to happen. Death, taxes, and stupid Florida man all in the same story. True. All right. Man with cat. Basically going to the Kit Kat bar brings sand to the beach because he brought his own cat. Man with cat tonight entry by Florida Strip Club. He, he basically claims discrimination, but he got arrested for various charges. We'll explain all of them for you. All right, we come back. We'll talk about Elon Musk, Twitter, Delaware Chancery Court, no jury, going to trial in a few months. I think he's in trouble. We'll talk about it. Stay with us. All right, we are back. When I say we are back, Craig Fontaine, Ashton Edward, Alan Shady, EAS. If it's in the game, it's in the game. Personal injury attorneys stealing topical events into the legal essence. Want to put a face to a voice? Go to ashtonandprice.com. Or if you like the show, which, you know, what's not to like? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Everything here is to like. <laughs> if you like the show, we have a significant library wherever you find your podcasts uh, on Apple or anywhere else. Type in the. It's important. The All Things Legal Show. And uh, all the uh, last, probably last four or five months of shows are on there. So that will help you improve your Jeopardy game. And if you don't like the show, you know, just send it to somebody else and uh, that you don't like. And at that point, uh, yeah, you kill two birds with one stone. Who knows? They might become your friend. Yeah, exactly. Go, thank you so much for that gift. Well, they'll learn it up on the show where they'll sue you. <laughs> no way. They'll say thank you for the gift yeah, of right. knowledge, <laughs> mirth. Yeah, All right, so uh, basically, also, we're uh, digitally recording today, so it'll pop up somewhere on the Internet. Not sure exactly where. All right, so before we get into UCLA and USC bailing from the Pac-12, with all the legal issues associated, Washington and Oregon are now talking about doing the same thing. 
uh, basically bailing out the Pac-12 because now the value of the Pac-12 has gone down dramatically. Um, you know, it's kind of like losing two of your best actors in a movie that you're playing. And all of a sudden, you know, you've got the supporting cast. It's not nearly <laughs> as great as two lead actors with UCLA and UCLA. I mean, it'll be interesting. I mean, what USC it, and UCLA. Yeah, it, 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 you know, especially in, uh, you know, Los Angeles. It'll affect the Los Angeles um, because they're not going to be having the West Coast teams coming down. You're going to have teams coming from out of state to play. But at the same time, it's going to be a uh, higher caliber of play, more likely than not. My, my feeling, my, just quick because we're going to get into Elon Musk, but my feeling is it's completely mismanaged. I mean, Cal is the number one university in the world publicly by most uh, ranking systems, not U.S. News and World Report, which basically determines you're ranked high because you got a good cafeteria and, and good, good bathroom service. So Cal's basically, academically, they're one of the top five, ten schools under any metric in the world, period. And that campus at Cal at Memorial Stadium's got one of the best views in the world. Your view is of downtown San Francisco. And the the beautiful campus built in the 1800s, Campanile, all the sight lines go straight out to the Golden Gate Bridge. It's amazing. And the fact that they cannot run a football program that doesn't sell out that stadium every weekend, shame on them. I mean, that is seriously mismanagement. And if UCLA and, and, uh, you know, and, you, and Cal are basically in debt, that's mismanagement. Because they have an amazing product and an amazing ca- campus and venue to, to sell that product. And it, it got so messed up that the Pac-12 does not have any foundational contractual obligations to the members so they can leave. And now Cal is looking at basically losing its major sports, sports programs. Oh, I don't know. I mean, you just brought it up a minute ago. They're in, no doubt in the top five, number one, two, number five in ranking. You got Harvard, Oxford, uh, Yale, uh, Brown. Uh, probably Columbia is all in there. And out of all those other schools in the top five, even the top ten universities in the world, their sports pro- programs suck. So they're <laughs> they're doing what they're supposed to do, educate people, uh, you know, for the real world and not necessarily say, hey, you're going to play football and going to make a living on this because you're more likely than not not going to make a living playing football if you graduated from the university because very few actually make it into the pros. So they're doing the job that they're supposed to do. It would be a benefit. If they actually would, you know, take one of those uh, and make it a class project for one of those <laughs> vaunted, you know, uh, award-winning uh, scholars over there to say, hey, we're going to we're gonna tax you with the proposition to see if you can turn around the program, at least financially. Yeah, I, I was watching PBS last night. It's basically a uh, mystery in Scotland. And you know what? They're using Apple iPhones in Scotland. And they come from Cal, Steve Wozniak. The, the San Francisco Bay Area essentially is responsible for the technology that has changed the world. And a lot of it has to do with Cal. And the fact that they cannot run a system with the ranking that we have, with the, the most beautiful campus, uh, you know, one of the most beautiful campuses in the world, and now we're beholden to UCLA who plays at the Rose Bowl? And now they're going to the Big Ten? I don't know. Something's got to be done. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's talk about what's going on with Elon Musk. So Elon Musk, I don't know what's going on. I mean, we said I talked about it on this show, and I think you agree with me. So why would you want to take over a private company as a guy who's the richest guy in the world to be the gatekeeper for free speech. Because you can. Because you say, all right, fine, Nazis are cool. Um, you know, misogynists are cool. Um, you know, I'm just going to be the free speech guy. It's a private business, but I'm going to be associated with all this basically hate speech. Why would you do that? So Elon Musk probably came to his sensibilities and said, you know what? That is a headache I don't need. And so he tried to find a way out of this. But what he did was, and this is the quote, he mounted a public spectacle to put Twitter in play. He did. Twitter didn't say we're for sale. Who wants to buy us? He said, I'll buy you because I'm the free speech guy. Made a public spectacle of it. He ended up getting a couple people fired at Twitter. Two people were fired. Three people resigned. They, they cut out their, their basically their um, search engine for new talent at Twitter because of him seeking them out and making a proposal which was signed a f- seller-friendly merger agreement. And then he goes on to basically trash the company. You know, people quit, trash the company. Basically says it's a bunch of bots and trashing the company and then disrupts its operations, destroys stockholder value, and then walks away. And, and they said, no, that ain't going to happen. You, you signed an agreement, and the problem you got is you're in Delaware. And Delaware is a very fast-track, non-jury trial environment whereby court basically said, look, we're going to fast-track. He wanted to postpone this until February 2023. They said, nope. Looks like it's going to be going to trial sometime in October yeah, of this year. It's going to go fast. Uh, there will be a lot of briefing on it, and then the issues will then come up. To, more likely than not, uh, they'll try to settle this thing. 
uh, before it gets to trial because neither one of them wants to find out what judge is going to say on it. Yeah, so the thing is, is that because it's a judge trial in a very corporate-friendly environment, I was looking at some of the, the foundational issues that are associated with the duties when you enter into an agreement as in Delaware for a basically a sale of a company. And here are the things that, that people try to do, okay? So Tyson was going to buy IBP, which is a meat distributor company. And so there was a, a deal for $3.2 billion. A harsh winter happened. And then Tyson got cold feet, said, I don't want to buy it, you know, because uh, the market has changed. They said, no, you, you've got an agreement. So they tried to terminate the deal. And then they said that IBP failed to disclose what are material uh, elements of the company, and that had what's called a material adverse effect on Tyson. Therefore, they can walk away from the deal. You know what the court said? No. Short-term financial dip is not a mat material adverse effect. You've got to do the deal. And then Tyson ended up having to do the deal. Yeah. It's, these are called mergers and acquisitions, M&As, and the MAE is the material adverse effect. But in this instance, two things that uh, – Elon Musk has gone in with one of them. He's arguing that there are more bot accounts than he thought there were in that. And, and for that, there are material adverse effects. But at the same time, he's been spouting that off before he even made the bid that they had a lot of fake accounts. So it's pretty hard to say that. I think that's materially going to adversely affect me when I've been arguing the entire time that you've had BS accounts on there. But the other ar other argument he has, which is stronger, and you brought it up, that certain you know, higher ups, the management of the company have now walked away. So he has much, much better standing, uh, his lawyers do, at least to make an argument that certain individuals leaving the company materially adverse the effect of the contract because those individuals were key elements in the running of Twitter, the uh, day, day operations, and the future of Twitter. And if they leave, that may, will materially adversely affect what I thought I was buying. So... Basically, here, just so you know, because this, this will basically make you the smartest person at your next, uh, or, you know, in terms of the conversation at your next uh, barbecue. So here's the things that can happen, right? So they can settle for a different number. They could do that. Or they could both agree to walk away. They could do that short of going to trial in uh, Delaware. There is what's called a liquidated damages clause, which says, hey, we cannot determine what walking away is going to look like in terms of damages, but any side walks away without good cause. And we're saying your bot thing is not good cause. You pay a billion bucks and you walk away. That could happen. Or Elon Musk could negotiate a different number. <coughs> Basically, he could say uh, 5420, I'm not doing that. Uh, there was a agreement between Tiffany and Moet, Hennessy, Louis Vuitton, which is LVMH. And it was for $16.2 billion. They were going to go to trial, I think, it w under, uh, under the same uh, chancery. Uh, and ultimately, they settled for $15.8 billion. So it saved... Um, Basically, LV, uh, LVMH, 400 million bucks, but they still went through with the purchase of Tiffany. Or Elon Musk can try this and win. Or t uh, Twitter could try this in front of the chancery and win and then try to enforce the $44 billion. Yeah, because he's got, what, a bid out there for $54.20 uh, $54 per share. Twitter's trading at around $37 a share. Or he could say, look, I'll pay the billion dollars. I still want the company. I'll put a new bid in at thirty nine, and still, be, and if it's accepted, still be ahead of the game. That's probably what's gonna, that, that's what I think is going to happen. Is there's going to be some sort of negotiated agreement? Because this, this is why. Because you know we, we're personal injury lawyers. I mean, we don't delve into merger and acquisitions, but we have the mental bandwidth to understand the concepts because a lot of it just is basically contract law. So here's what got me. So Huntsman uh, v. Hexian, which is basically during two thousand and eight. Uh, this is a financial crisis case where Huntsman was going to buy Hexian, and they were basically going to merge. And then Huntsman, the company Huntsman, said, hey, um, because of the financial crisis, we couldn't get financing. And the court said, hey, guess what? You've got to use your best efforts. Same thing during COVID. You've got to use your best efforts. It's not like Elon Musk is saying, now I can't find financing. Well, you just can't say that after a few days of looking, and the people that you had the cocktail with said, now they're not going to do it anymore. That's not best efforts. And so he's going to be scrutinized to say, all right, fine. You said you couldn't find financing. Richest man in the world who basically has all this Tesla stock who definitely can secure financing. There's all kinds of companies out there probably loan you, you know, 6%. I'm not kidding. He could put up part of his uh, boring company stock because he privately owns that. He could put up uh, you know, private equity in his other companies. Yeah, I will leverage all my companies to get this loan. And the court could say, you need to do that. 
Now, granted, like you said, we do personal injury, but we are fortunate to have an attorney in the office that does have a very nice background uh, that's worked in the financial world, your brother, Scott, yeah. for many, many years and understands mergers, acquisitions, uh, and things like that. So we, you know, we can bounce this stuff off him from time to time, and he's a very good insight on that. Yeah, so the, the, the idea is this, is that Elon Musk can say two things. There's a material adverse effect in regards to the bots, and the argument is, hey, you knew about that before, and tell us what you did to figure out or what we didn't provide to you to give you the information to ha raise that to the level where you can walk away. And then the second thing is he's going to say he can't secure financing now. And the reason he can't secure financing is primarily because his Tesla stock has gone down d dramatically. But you and I could use our best efforts, Ed, um, and we would never come up with $44 billion in financing. <laughs> you, well, you and I personally. I don't know. I've never tried. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, you might surprise yourself. What, what, what? <laughs> Are we announcing something here that you're putting your hat in for Twitter at uh, $54 a share? I'm going to buy the Pac-12. <laughs> you're going to buy the Pac-12. <laughs> right. So the point is this, is that Elon Musk can now, he, he's got two arguments. Hey, a material adverse effect because of the bots. And if the court doesn't buy that, he can say, well, I can't get uh, secure financing. Well, there's definitely precedent for that. Say, fine, you can say that all you like, richest guy in the world. But you got to show us what you did. And you better have a very good litany of efforts that shows us that you used not only good faith, but your best efforts. And if you didn't use your best efforts, then the court could say, look, this is the thing. Contracts matter. You went out and you said, I want to buy Twitter. They didn't ask you. It was unsolicited. You signed an agreement that was friendly to the seller. And then you go out and trash the company, and then ultimately you want to walk away? No. You're going to have to buy it. And I think that outcome is more likely to happen than he gets to walk away. No, you're probably right. And But, you know, the one article I was reading said that his probably his strongest argument is that after the, after the offer was made, Twitter fired two top executives at the company, and that may constitute that a could mater be material adverse That effect. could be that material adverse effect that he would you know, yeah. hang his hat on. He's got to make that argument. All right, when we come back, we'll talk about UCLA leaving to the Big Ten, and then Florida Man going crazy as only Florida Man can. Stay with us. All right, we are back. When I say we are back, Craig Fontaine Ashton, Edward Allen, Shady EAS. If it's in the game, it's in the game. You find yourself smack dab in the middle. Show we called All Things Legal. We're going to talk about UCLA leaving the Big Ten and whether or not there's any sort of legal avenues whereby a public university in California can stiff its basically progenitor, Cal, and walk away, make more money, and say, thanks for coming, thanks for the memories, or whether or not as a public university that bears some sort of legal obligation to its sister school, to basically its parent, really, if you look at it. Well, you missed it by three letters in one word. It should have been how they can stiff arm, because <laughs> this is football. So we're going to talk about that, and then we're also going to talk about Arnold Schwarzenegger deliberately farted into my face. So that's assault, battery, work comp claim. Uh, definitely the woman, it happened a while ago, but she still has total recall. Oh, <laughs> and he's be, saying it's true lies he said you want to smell my back <laughs> <laughs> yeah smell my back <laughs> i just let out a whopper of course. <laughs> all right newsom defends uh, demands that ucla publicly explain deal leave uh pac-12 so if you haven't been paying attention last week kind of secretly usc and ucla under the radar because apparently ucla doesn't have to consult with the uc regions made a unilateral decision Based upon its broad-based uh, um, authority, yeah. it's basically they have a lot of authority to, to kind of do what they want, um, and it's you know it's just basically delegated to them. And the reason that they did that, I think, within UC schools is they would say, "Hey, look, you guys are higher education, and politics and education don't go well together. And, and as long as you're not doing anything illegal, we're going to let you do it." And they didn't anticipate UCLA leaving the Pac-12, which is really going to harm Cal, which is the only other big. Uh, school in terms of sports in uh, the UC system. And the, the money that's shared with these TV contracts is pretty significant. And when they walk away like that and say, sorry, Cal, thanks for the memories, you know, we've got your fight song, we use your colors, uh, but, you know, we, we don't have any uh, financial obligation to support you anymore going forward, and we're leaving for uh, greener pastures. Um, Gavin Newsom basically said, look, here's what I think needs to happen. Um, I, we need UCLA, here's the quote, uh, the first duty of every public university is to the people, especially students. And I agree with that. I mean, whether or not you like Newsom, but I agree with that. And UCLA must clearly explain to the public how this deal, leaving to the Big Ten, will improve the experience for all student athletes and then will honor its century-old partnership with UC Berkeley and will preserve the histories, rivalries, and traditions that are enrich our communities. Because it's really true. I mean, we, we do have a rich, you know, 
sisterhood, brotherhood, you know, relationship with UCLA. I mean, well, they can still play non-season games with them. Yeah, but it's it's basically I mean, non-conference games. It's it's and forget the emotional sent, sentimental part of it, but the amount of money that's going to be lost is is significant. And then what will happen once they go to the Big Ten? Because we talked about this, and I think you were um, with family. Uh, basically, now the, the offshoot is going to be Oregon's going to leave, then Washington's going to leave. So that leaves basically the Pac-8 with all of the marquee schools gone, and then that's just not going to be a saleable, uh, basically, but, conference. It's just yeah, not. No, nobody's going to want to watch it on TV. No contract with a, a major network is going to go in there and try to generate revenue from that. They want to get pe- games people are going to tune into, which kind of surprises me in the sense that, you know, here we are, the big... The Big Ten Conference, and you're going, okay, we're going to allow you in. But you don't even have a stadium on campus. Why are we going to let you in when we have to travel over there and we're not even going to have a college crowd necessarily there on in campus for uh, all of the networking that would now normally occur at tailgating? Uh, but at the same time, Newsom, I'll explain Newsom how this is going to work. It's not going to affect the other programs at the school. In fact, it may even help the other programs at the school. If more money is coming in, it will actually fund some of the non-revenue generating programs. They may be able to bring back the swim team at UCLA that they don't that they lost a while back. The water polo team can benefit the uh, women's gymnastics, all of this, because you do not have to be in the same conference. You can have the basketball team in one conference, football team in another conference. So the Pac-12 basketball may not change in any way, shape, or form. Uh, UCLA basketball will still be playing locally and in local schools, but it, just because the football team's leaving doesn't mean that the rest of the programs are necessarily leaving to the Big Ten. So here, here's what UCLA said while they're leaving. They go, look, it's way, way more media exposure if we go to Big Tens in Michigan and all those schools, way more media exposure for us. Also saying that because we're going to be back east a lot of the times, the sport, the uh, sporting events, the football games will be on a much more civilized hour. Because if you if you watch Pac-12 games, they're, they're all late. they're all in like seven eight o'clock, you know. And it's you know, <laughs> when Cal's not doing super well, I'm not staying up until twelve o'clock uh, midnight to watch Cal <laughs> lose to you know some school <laughs> like Rutgers or something. It's not going to happen. So th- the point is this. So you say say look, sorry, but we have autonomy basically, to make this decision. There's no contractual obligation that we can see where we owe you anything. We get to make these decisions on our own. And we're looking for more media exposure. We're looking for better recruiting. And we're also looking for the name, image, and likeness, which Gavin Newsom pushed, to say, hey, students are really, let's stop this. I mean, they're basically generating money for these campuses. Oh, there you have it, the unintended consequences of Gavin Newsom's policies. Hey, let's go out and do name, image, and name image and likeness and now school saying yeah we're going to use that as well so we can generate more revenue for our students etc so every decision that is made at the top has an unintended consequence associated with it and this is one of them well yeah that, that was uh, one of them it's it, part of it the primary thing was the media exposure and the, and the tv contract yeah, for sure but the only person hurt in this is berkeley only person would well, no. It, it hurts. I mean, it hurts only, Oregon. Hurts Washington. It hurts Oregon State. It hurts I, Washington State. I don't care. I'm not a citizen of those, and my tax dollars don't go up there. The only university that is connected to me by any way, shape, or form, by way of being in the state that I live in, that I pay taxes to, is Berkeley. Outside of that. That's the only person that matters to me that is getting hurt by this, and it's only the football program. Well, I will paraphrase John Dunn to say that when the Pac-12 is harmed, I'm a part of Pac-12. But I never and was. therefore, when the Pac-12 is harmed, it harms me. And so ultimately, do not ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for you, Ed. No, it doesn't. I would say I played in the PC2, Ed, the Pacific Coast Athletic Association, <laughs> which is, I think, the Big West now. It doesn't even exist. Uh, that was 30 years ago. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because John Dunn said, look, if, if, uh, if a man is hurt, I am harmed because I'm part of mankind. So, you know, part of the Pac-12, if you like Oregon, it be, you know, I, I like Oregon. It's a good school. It's a great school. Um, you know, uh, Animal House was filmed there. But at the same time, it would be interesting if the other Pac-12 schools, especially Berkeley, because they have Bolt Hall, which is a fine institution and, uh, you know, law school, could come up with a reason to sue UCLA and uh, put the kibosh on this uh, departure and say, hey, look, you know, we're third-party beneficiaries of the contract that you and I were members of, and there was an ongoing you know, arms like the agreement that it was going to continue in the future as a revenue generating source of income for the rest of the Pac-12, and therefore we're going to file for an injunctive and see if we can stop you from leaving. It'd be interesting. 
Well, yeah, um, maybe what we need to do is have our engineering uh, and our chemistry departments, our physics departments sign deals with applied materials, Intel, and, you know, we can just fund ourselves that way. They can't <laughs> because then you become a uh, – it's a nonprofit university that becomes profit, you know, profit. They lose their uh, tax. Well, status. that's what that's what this is. Is though they, these are basically they're making uh, more than they're putting in to put back into the school. So Cal just needs to kind of leverage their intellectualism, and then next thing you know, we're the Silicon Valley of uh, the Pac-12. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> oh god, who makes the electronic dogs on the East Coast? It was a spinoff out of MIT. It's Boston, Boston Scientific came out of research and development department at, at MIT, and they had to spin it off because if it became a profitable product, then it was going to change the tax status. So here's the ultimate outcome. UCLA has absolute, they have no contractual obligation to stay in the Pac-12. They're a public university, but they've been delegated broad authority that is according to the UC, the chancellor of the UC regents. So the moral of the story is, is that there's not a whole lot that can be done, except there is some discussion reportedly that in order to claw back some of that money for Cal, which is the one that's going to be harmed the most because they have the, they're, they're the only other UC public university that has major sports, that UCLA is going to have to pay an exit fee to Cal or share the revenue, TV revenue. And I think contractually they could do those things to make this not nearly the green pasture move that UCLA thinks it is. Who knows? We'll find out. Yeah, I mean, come on. They're getting divorced. You know, every divorce has got to lead to some sort of community property sharing, right? <laughs> and we are the community property state. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. I mean, you just can't. I don't know of any real world experience where you are married to a either a person, entity, or a set of ideas, and you get to walk away freely, make more money, and say, thanks for coming. Thanks for all your support. I'm not paying you anything. When is the departure date? Is it uh, next season or two seasons? No, out? it's going to be August 2024. Okay, yeah, because uh, with regard to the Big 12, uh, you have Texas and— It's Big 10. Well, no, the Big 12. The Big 12. Yeah. How many how many teams are in the Big Twelve? Like twenty? No, ten actually. <laughs> they, 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 have like, they have eighteen teams in the Big Ten. I mean, that just tells you how their academics are. They can't even add out there. Yeah, but it's funny though. I mean, we got twelve teams. It's the Pac twelve. It's twelve teams. It's not it's not the Pac twelve with twenty teams. Well, two of the big teams. Come o- on, Oklahoma, OU, and, add. and Texas, the Longhorns are both leaving to go to the SEC in twenty twenty four. Take away the calculators from those schools and don't can find their uh, history class. So this is not unprecedented that large teams and gen- money generating teams move from conference to conference. What time is it? I don't know. I can't read anything other than the digital clock. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All wait, right. wait, wait. Well, the only person caught with their pants down is Cal. Right, and that's Oski. <laughs> you know, Oski with his pants down is not a good look. Yeah. All right. Arnold Schwarzenegger deliberately farted in my face. All right, so this is assault, battery, and a work comp claim. So during the end of days, which apparently the story is, is that Satan comes down. Satan's going to marry somebody in the United States of America, have some offspring, which is not being a good thing for humanity. Arnold Lab, I mean, uh, Arnold Lab, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Lab was a attorney I learned from Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, gets involved. Holds down the woman. Her name is Miriam Margolis, and she is playing Satan's mother. And holds her down during one of the takes, and then deliberately flatulates in her face. Jeez. And she says, I'll never forgive him for that. I was playing Satan's sister. I, she was playing Satan's sister. And he was killing me. So he had me in a position where I couldn't escape and lying on the floor. And then he... Basically pauses and flashlights in her face. And maybe she says, I, was, I haven't forgiven for it, and I never will. Maybe he thought he was playing the Green Lantern and he was using some of that food gas. <laughs> so that so assault is the apprehension of harmful or offensive contact. So when you hear the noise, boom, that's basically the apprehension. That's an assault. Battery is when it hits your olfactory sense. Boom, battery. Or comp claim, breach of contract, intentional infliction of emotional distress, all those things. I mean, especially if he had uh, schnitzel for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she goes on and just starts bagging on other actors and stuff, like saying another certain actor didn't wash all of his bits and pieces, and he smelled on set. But in this instance, that's pretty uh, unbecoming of a gentleman to do that to anybody, especially another woman. I mean, the guy thinks he's in the locker room in eighth grade running around going to give somebody a beef stew. Who knows? Yeah, he, he basically showed his, his Hermione and became Harry Farter. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Instead of, I'll be back. Hey, here's my backside. So there could be defamation because it's a statement of fact about Arnold Schwarzenegger that flashlighted in an older woman's face who's playing Satan's sister. Um, that is a statement of fact I'm concerned Arnold Schwarzenegger, which, if not true, could be defamatory. She says she's got total recall. He could say it's true lies. And then basically to start referring to some of his movies, Red Heat, Moscow Detective, Conan the Barbarian, clearly. I mean, that's clearly. barbaric. Kindergarten cop, he's acting like a kindergartner. Escape plan. All of it. But apparently he had that, but she didn't know about it. Aftermath could be the lawsuit. You know what she wanted to be? The running man, run away yeah. from that. And then uh, after that, he became the last action hero. And then he starred in The Expendables Part Deux. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, so that's Arnold Schwarzenegger being accused of assault, battery, work comp violation, intentional infliction of emotional stress as a result of letting his better angels go to the side to Conan and Barbarian and let the Barbarian in him basically have free reign. Well, and number, number one, how does she prove that it was intentional? And two, how does she prove it ever occurred unless somebody else heard it or smelt it? Well, she could have seen what, basically his facial expressions, uh, you know, um, whether or not he laughed afterwards. Well, Arnold would say, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> and he would say, who smelt it? Delta. <laughs> yeah. The Terminator. All right, we come back. Florida man accused of urinating in the middle of the street, trying to maintain a steady flow of traffic. Stay with us. All right, we are back. When I say we, Craig Fontaine, Ashton, Edward, Allen, Shady, a shady attorney, give us some legal direction. We are personal injury attorneys by trade. Do not take the lack of grab toss and mirth because we're about ready to get into Florida, man. So this is not... Conflate with what we do for a living. What we do for a living, we flip a switch and get very aggressive, very focused, and ultimately anticipate several stages down the particular litigation path. What needs to be done so our clients can focus on the most important thing, which is their health. Um, you know, mostly, you know, even the client that has a fractured tibia, fibula, and femur. Because those are big bones, he's younger, and he's you know he's a, a just got out of the, the army. You know, he came to uh, Sacramento to start a new life, and he's just got out of the army three years ago. And I was telling Ed that your son's uh, in the army. He's uh, going to be a captain coming up, right? Yeah, yeah. He's a first lieutenant right now in the garrison, Bavarian garrison for the United States Army in Germany, and he's coming back to go to captain school. By this time next year, we'll have to start saluting. Yeah, and so those type of things, I mean, ho hopefully he'll, he'll get his health back because we have some really great doctors. Once he gets out of the convalescent facility he's in in Palo Alto through the VA, we'll get him up here because the VA, you know, they, they perform, um, they give good medical care, but it's very slow. It's very bureaucratic. We're going to get him out of that, streamline him into the very best uh, extremity orthopedic surgeons, spine orthopedic surgeons, so he can determine what the best course of care is so he can get his health back as quickly as possible. That's what we do. That takes serious uh, focus. That's not what we're doing here. And you were mentioning, Ed, that if Arnold Schwarzenegger does have to go in front of a jury as a result of the misconduct that is uh, attributed to him. Yeah, there's a jury instruction uh, specifically on point says, who smelt it, dealt it. Yeah, whoever, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen of the jury, setting aside the facts, I think it is conclusory to say. Whoever smelt it. Whoever smelt it. Dealt it. Dealt it. I uh, rest my case. <laughs> and then he'd probably get acquitted. <laughs> and he can go party with Johnny Depp. And as you turn around, you <laughs> fart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You can go have uh, get uh, get pirate on the situation with Depp in the Caribbean somewhere. Um, all right, so let's talk about Florida Man. One of uh, the nice thing about Florida Man is the First Amendment trumps their right to privacy, so we get to hear about all their stupid behavior. This one I thought was interesting because it's basically got all kinds of things. Uh, it's got uh, drunken public. It's got basically indecent exposure. Um, it's got a creative way to actually direct traffic when uh, you believe that you need to do your civic duty to help uh, traffic go by after you cause an auto accident. A 35-year-old year, uh, Winter Park man was arrested on allegations of urinating in the middle of the roadway while directing traffic. Hmm. So, I mean, he, he, that, that's, it's kind of a wobbler because you're going, hey, the guy's trying to help. But, you know, urinating, you know, following the yellow brick road. Yeah, yellow brick road. <laughs> He's the passenger in the vehicle, thank goodness. He drank quite a bit, apparently, and that's one of those dual uh, two left-hand turn lanes. And he got out just to go relieve himself. Now, it would be great if they had the music jamming and they were playing Even Flow by Pearl Jam as he's out there doing this. <laughs> well, the Florida PD said, you're in big trouble. And so Terrence Rouse was rousted and arrested around 1 p.m. So during the day. So this is not usually see this at 1, 1 a.m., right? 1 p.m. Friday in Fern Park on charges of indecent exposure of sexual organs, possessions, and use of drug equipment. Huh. I think that explains a little bit of it. The drug equipment? Yeah, because usually you're not making this decision without some sort of altered uh, cognitive state. Well, they didn't say he was under the influence, and he said he drank a lot of water and just couldn't wait And <laughs> while they were stopped at the light and got out and had to go. I mean, yeah, he said, hey, I got an excuse. I drank a lot of water. It's either right here in the middle. I can kill two birds with one stone. I mean, clearly before you got here, we needed direct traffic because there is a traffic impediment. And I also have to urinate. So I was doing both, so I was multitasking. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I should get an accommodation, not a ticket. It's interesting. It's a Florida man that doesn't necessarily have alcohol in his things in his system. But the deputy said a bottle. There was a bottle in his backpack with the smell of and residue of marijuana. Digital scale and baggies were found in the uh, car. So the guy, you know, sounds like a dealer. Yeah. So yeah, he's got digital scale and bag. And, and he said it wasn't his. It was the backpack was in the car. And the driver said it's not mine. It's his. Yeah. It's the guy who's urinating in the street. I mean, that's clear. 
Yeah, he's already going to get <laughs> yeah. thrown under Nothing the bus. Nothing to see here. I may be high on methamphetamine, but let's pay attention to the guy urinating in the street drinking traffic. <laughs> Throw my buddy under the bus. <laughs> the <laughs> short bus. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that's, hey, he's got a record and it's a weird one. <laughs> Yeah, he's going to, you know, it's not a moving violation. I mean, these guys just got to turn around this energy. I mean, the guys that drive, you know, 30 miles an hour on a, on a uh, tractor, uh, lawnmower, NASCAR, perfect fit. Go get some training. Uh, this guy this guy would be perfect uh, as a traffic uh, cop. Perfect. I'd be interested. He shows up in court and says, Your Honor, can I go to traffic school for this? <laughs> this <laughs> <on> my record. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, yeah. So he, he, you're in big trouble. All right, man. With Cat, brought sand to the beach to the Kit Kat bar because he was denied entry to Florida Strip Club. <coughs> so, it's a weird story. So, Everett Lages tried to enter a Murdoch, Florida strip joint with a kitten, but they were both refused entry. <laughs> they probably would have let the kitten in, but the dude was like, you know, clearly he's got to be intoxicated. Oh, I like this because he's going, to, this is at the Emerald City Gentlemen's Club where they said, can't come in with the kitty cat. Yeah, right. So, uh, he goes, wait, that seems ironic. I know, but then. <laughs> I love where they uh, they they rec- they directed him to go down to the Pussycat Lounge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, if you bring a kitten, you get in for free. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, basically, they called a taxi for the guy. Say you're not coming in. The taxi arrived. So Lage wouldn't cooperate with the driver. Instead, he began yelling and causing disturbance, and insisted the club owner had committed a crime by denying him entry to him and his cat. He thought it's just discrimination. Clearly, men trying to get into strip clubs with a kitten are a protected class. It's just like sex, age, religion, um, nationality, etc. Right. Ethnicity. I'm a protected class. This is basically discrimination, violation of the Civil Rights Act, because you're not letting me in with my kitten. And they go, no, that's not what it is. This is my comfort like animal. You have to let me in with my comfort animal. Right. If it's a service animal versus basically a comfort animal, then maybe he could get in. If it was a C and I kitten. Well, um, who needs a seeing eye dog at a strip club? <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that, that's pretty good. <laughs> All right. Come on. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's almost as good as uh, whoever smelt it dealt it. I mean, he yeah. needs a CNI club at a strip club. A uh, CNI dog at a strip My club. My dog likes to come and watch. So here's where he gets himself in trouble. So he won't get in the taxi. So he calls 911 Multiple. on his cell phone. Multiple times. Even though deputies were clearly at the scene. So that is in California Penal Code Section 148.3, misuse of 911. So unless you've got a pretty good excuse uh, or a lot of scratch... Ooh. <laughs> You're definitely going to get in trouble for misusing 911 like that. So, yeah, he got busted for what? Disorderly intoxication, trespassing after warning, residual, resisting arrest with violence, sitting on $4,000 bail. So, this is false imprisonment in a different way. A Florida man and woman spent two days trapped in what they said they believed to be a locked closet until police let them out and discovered that the door was actually never locked. <laughs> Can you imagine? So I mean, they, they could basically, that, that would be false imprisonment if somebody did that on purpose. It could be negligent if they were in the janitor's closet at the community college and somebody locked them in there and they were stuck there for two days. But it turns out that when the officers got there, they found a Brillo pad, which looks like they were probably smoking crack, and the door was unlocked. Yeah, I didn't know that. It's that uh, they well, found if, if you knew that, we'd be in trouble then. They found human feces <laughs> in the closet and a scouring pad. That they said was commonly used to smoke crack. I didn't know that they you <laughs> used a Brillo pad for crack. It was a crappy situation for sure. No kidding. And uh, at the end of the day, they have no cause of action except for perhaps they can sue themselves for stupidity. Well, they didn't find any drugs because they probably used them all, and that's why they were stuck in there two days. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm going to do your job for you, and I'm going to find myself guilty. No kidding. I locked myself in an unlocked closet for two days and then called 911. <laughs> Yeah, but this guy's got an, already has a criminal record, include armed burglary and theft of firearms. So, you know, this is a, a nice pair. All right, Uncle Rico goes back to the future. Death taxes and stupid Florida man are the things that are certain in life. So this guy sped through a traffic light intersection North Davis Highway and West Fairfield Drive in Florida at 10.50, 10.50 a.m., so it's early. Yeah. He travels to the front entrance of Advanced Tax Services, right next to the co-owner of Pensacola Caskets. So we get death and taxes right there. Boom. He said the building was unstable on the backside. They told us it was, he couldn't go back in because the guy's uh, car caused so much damage to the particular building. So this would be tortious interference with contractual relations. It definitely is a trespass. We got property damage, and this individual is de- going to be facing a lot. And he said he was doing it because he was trying to tra- time travel. Well, this is the interesting thing. 
So under your auto insurance policy, you have property damage. So if he'd lost control, hit the building, it would pay up to the extent of the policy limit. But in this instance, when you say you do it on purpose, I wanted to time travel and drove it into the building, his auto carrier can say that's an intentional act, which is not covered under the policy, and you're stuck with the bill, so, buddy. So what he said was, is I'm going to back out, I'm going to do this again like it never happened. Oh. <laughs> But time travel didn't work, so he found out the hard way that time travel is not a real thing, at least as they show in the movies. Yeah, yeah. And Uncle Rico meets Back to the Future, Death Taxes, and Florida Man. That's the show. Thanks for listening. Have a great rest of the day. You've been listening to the All Things.